In this overview, we will be talking about how some of the most common antibiotics work. Let's begin with a reminder of the structure of bacteria. But first, remember to hit that subscribe button for more fun and educational videos like this one. There are two main groups of bacteria we'll be discussing today, gram-negative organisms and gram-positive organisms. They are classified based on their gram stain. But what exactly is a gram stain? Gram stain is named after the Danish physician Hans Christian Gram, who created the staining technique for visualizing bacteria. Therefore, when we refer to gram stains, use a capital G. Bacteria cell walls are made of a substance called peptidoglycan. It's made of a polymer of amino acids and sugars that serves a fundamental role in the structure and integrity of the cell. The bacterial wall is there for the same reason our skin is there, to keep the insides in and the outsides out. Bacteria differ though in the types of walls they have. Gram-positive organisms have a thick peptidoglycan layer that retains crystal violet stain, making them purple after gram staining. Gram-negative organisms have two distinct layers, a lipopolysaccharide membrane, or short for LPS, that surrounds a thin layer of peptidoglycan. The LPS membrane does not retain crystal violet stain, therefore they are stained later in the process by a pink counterstain called safranin, making gram-negative organisms pink after gram staining. A great memorization tip is to keep your P's together, or in this sense, the letter P. Gram-positive bacteria has a P in the name to help you remember that it stains purple while gram-negative bacteria does not because they stain different shades of red such as reddish pink. Once you have made it past the cytoplasmic membrane and cell wall, you have reached the organism's cytoplasm wherein resides the organism's ribosomes, genetic material, and other enzymes important to the bacterium's survival. All things basically that antibodies have been designed to target. Bacteria have ribosomes that translate messenger RNA into polypeptides and contain two subunits, the large 50S and small 30S subunits. Ribosomes are factories for protein synthesis, and proteins are responsible for all cell functions, including things such as protective proteins, transport proteins, toxin proteins, and so much more. Now that we remember the general structure of bacteria, let's talk about how different antibiotics target them. We will talk about the antibiotics that work on the cell wall first, and then make our way to antibiotics that work in the cytoplasm. There are two main antibiotics that work by disrupting the inner and outer membranes of bacteria cell wall, disrupting their function and leading to bacteria cell death. That is polymyxin and daptomycin. Polymyxin, such as colistin and polymyxin B, act like soap. They bind to outer lipid-containing layers of gram-negative organisms and make the cell wall unstable, causing the cytoplasm and its contents to leak out, killing the bacteria. Since these agents bind to the LPS layer, they have no activity against gram-positive bacteria, which, if you can remember back, lack this layer. Daptomycin works by inserting itself into the cytoplasmic membrane of gram-positive bacteria, weakening the membrane and causing cations to leak out of the cytoplasm, stopping processes that are essential to the life of the bacterium and therefore killing it. A few antibiotics target the creation of the cell wall itself. This includes phosphomycin, beta-lactams, monobactam, and vancomycin. Phosphomycin inhibits the enzyme that catalyzes the first step of cell wall synthesis, Beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems contain something called beta-lactam ring that irreversibly binds to the enzymes on the cell membrane in bacteria called penicillin-binding proteins, or PBPs. This stops the final step in the creation of the peptoglycan layer of bacteria cell walls, making the cell walls defective and unstable, leading to a series of events that ultimately kills the bacteria. Astreonam, a monobactam antibiotic, also works similarly to beta-lactams. Cephidericol, a cytophore cephalosporin, has activity like other beta-lactam antibiotics, but has a unique method of getting to the penicillin-binding proteins on the cytoplasmic membrane. It has a side chain that chelates with ferric iron, forming a complex that is then transported across the LPS layer of gram-negative bacteria into the periplasmic space. This helps it bypass many mechanisms gram-negative bacteria have for antibiotic resistance, such as beta-lactamases. It's considered kind of cool in the ideal world, as the brand name for Troja hints at the mechanism of action similar to a Trojan horse sneaking into the cell. Vancomycin is a glycopeptide antibiotic that also works on cell wall biosynthesis. Glycopeptides are way too big to get into the outer layer of gram-negative bacteria, so Unlike beta-lactam antibiotics, glycopeptides only work on gram-positive organisms. 
they bind to the dialanil dialanine precursor, or short for diala diala. Diala diala is an important component of peptoglycan. So when glycopeptides block its formation, they are stopping cell walls from being built. The lipoglycopeptide antibiotics like televancin, dalbavancin, and aritavancin are like cousins to vancomycin that work the same way, but with an added mechanism of action similar to daptomycin that disrupts the cell membrane, causing it to depolarize and become permeable, killing the cell. Now that we have destroyed the cell wall, let's talk about some antibiotics that work in the cytoplasm. Several antibiotics act on the ribosome, a complex molecule that serves as the factory for protein synthesis. Aminoglycosides like genomycin, tobramycin, and amikacin, as well as tetracycline antibiotics like tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, tigracycline, omatocycline, and oravacycline are protein synthesis inhibitors that irreversibly bind to the small 30S ribosomal subunit. Clindamycin macrolides linezolid and tadizolid, which belong to the class of oxazolidinones, as well as lafadmalin, are protein synthesis inhibitors that interact with the big 50S ribosomal subunit, interfering with polypeptide chain synthesis and leading to bacteria cell death. Next, folic acid is synthesized by bacteria from the substrate paraaminobenzoic acid, or PABA, and all cells require folic acid for growth. However, folic acid cannot cross bacteria cell walls by diffusion or active transport. For this reason, bacteria must synthesize folic acid from PABA. Sulfonamide antibiotics such as sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprin work synergistically with one another by interfering with folic acid production within the bacterium. Trimethoprim binds dihydrofolate reductase, and sulfamethoxazole competitively inhibits dihydrofolic acid synthesis by mimicking PABA, preventing the final step of the process. To help you remember this, think of the FO in sulfonamides as inhibiting folic acid synthesis. Lastly, a few antibiotics work against nucleic acids, the primary molecules that make up DNA, either directly or indirectly by inhibiting their production or repair. Fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin, as well as delafloxacin, inhibit enzymes called DNA topoisomerases, which includes DNA gyrase and DNA topoisomerase 4, interfering with DNA replication, transcription, repair, recombination, and transposition. So basically, a lot of things dealing with DNA. Vidaxomycin works specifically on a bacteria called C. difficile. It inhibits RNA polymerases, making it useful for treating only that bacterium. Metronidazole targets only anaerobic bacteria like Bacteroides species and protozoa like Giardia. It may be metabolized into a molecule that disrupts DNA and inhibits its synthesis, but we don't really know how it works for sure. And it isn't the only common antibiotic that we don't know for sure how it functions. Nitrofurantoin, an antibiotic helpful only for treating urinary tract infections, is also metabolized into molecules that inactivate ribosomes, DNA, and RNA, but we don't know for sure. To wrap it up, let's review some quick mnemonics on how to remember the mechanism of action of some of the antibiotic classes discussed. Cell membrane slash cell wall inhibitors, you can remember the mnemonic, destroys protective fortification and murders various bacteria. The first two antibiotics in the mnemonic disrupt bacteria cell membrane and the rest work on bacteria cell wall. And this includes daptomycin, polymyxin B, phosphomycin, monobactam, vancomycin, and beta-lactams. Protein synthesis inhibitors, you can remember the mnemonic, you're at 30th street for 30S ribosome, and you want to come to 50th street for 50S ribosomes. So the 30S ribosome inhibitors include aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. The 50S inhibitors include clindamycin, oxazolidinones, and macrolides. For antibiotics that inhibit folic acid synthesis, remember back to the mnemonic FO in sulfonamides as inhibiting folic acid synthesis, and that includes sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Antibiotics that inhibit DNA RNA synthesis, think of the F in the first letters of these antibiotics as standing for a DNA RNA fiber. The X in the middle of fidaxomycin also looks like a chromosome. I hope this helps you remember the antibiotics. So to test if you can remember the mechanism of action of these antibiotics, let's do a self-assessment. Which antibiotic binds to penicillin binding proteins, making cell walls ineffective and unstable? A. Beta-lactam antibiotics. B. Vancomycin. C. Sulfonamides. Or D. Fidaxomycin. The answer is A. Beta-lactam antibiotics. Which enzyme is inhibited by fluoroquinolone antibiotics? 
And the answer is D, DNA topoisomerases or DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4. Which antibiotics work at the 50S ribosomal subunit? Select all that apply. And the answer is A, B, and C. Remember, you want to come to 50th Street. And tadizolid belongs to the oxalidinone class.